Hi, Ava. Thanks for joining us. Hey, hello. Good afternoon or good morning. Brilliant. Thank you. I've already introduced you. Your, your name is famous in our sector because of all the amazing work you've been doing in COIL. And we know we've seen you on the IC Global circuit, as well as we know that you're a leading light in internationalization at home in EAIE. So I don't want to take up any more of your, your time because we know your work speaks for itself. And we invite you to give your first session, which we're all excitedly uh, looking forward to. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. OK, let me share my screen. Really nice to see some familiar faces this morning or this afternoon for me. Um, so. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me to speak about this, uh, I think, very interesting topic. And thank you for all the wonderful videos um, on the YouTube channel. I felt very inspired watching all of them. And I would love to you know, reference most of them, but I can't. Um, it's, I only have 20 minutes, but uh, know that I've, I've watched them and I, I'm very inspired by all of the many examples. So what I'd like to talk to you about um, today, about the potential of virtual exchange or COIL as a co-creative experience is but one of the examples because there are many more as, as we saw in the in the video. So I'm located at the uh, in Amsterdam in the Netherlands at the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences, which is um, a university that teaches mostly in Dutch, predominantly Dutch is the language of instruction. So internationalization at home for us is, is very important in our internationalization strategy. Um, and uh, internationalization at home does not have an, as an aim to have to create more mobility, to have more incoming or outgoing students because there are only limited number of students that can speak Dutch to you know, on the level so that they can actually follow the classes. So for us, internationalization at home really is to prepare students for the globalized international reality that is uh, working life in, uh, in the metropolitan area of, of Amsterdam and in the region of Europe. Um, so to contextualize a little bit what I'm talking about, so for, for us, internationalization at home is not a driver for mobility, but it is a driver for global learning. Um, so let's go. So first, uh, I want to take a moment to say something about more traditional forms of learning, learning that has a greater emphasis on knowledge transfer than on knowledge production. So we read, there are conferences that we attend, we learn by observing, by listening, by memorizing, by criticizing, and all of these methods can happen on campus, online, at home, in the community, or abroad. And they're all necessary, right? This is how we acquire the knowledge that we need to function in the world. And this is the business that we're in, the education business that we're in, but it's only part of the story. Global learning or internationalized learning implies the experience of connecting, connecting the me and the you, connecting the local to the global or the international, connecting between different cultures, different perspectives, and it implies creating a new map of the world and of ourselves in that world. So how we connect our little bullets of knowledge into an experience that will help us connect the dots later in life as well. And it's helpful if you have another structure besides the regular courses and activities throughout the curriculum that students can connect those dots with so that they can build a path to the future and a coherent perspective on the world. And so creativity, I, to me, resonates with innovation and co-creation to me is one of the pathway, pathways to more innovative or creative learning and solution finding. So this brings me to uh, as, uh, an image that I often use when I speak in my university or in, um, uh, in, in different universities about the need for internationalization at home and the need for or the contextualization of virtual exchange or COIL. So this is an image that represents an old story where six blind men or six blind people, because there's a lady in, the, in this image as well. Six blind people are invited into a room and in this room, there's an elephant. And because they cannot see, they're asked to describe what the elephant looks like, but from you know, where they are. So they assume a certain position and they start to describe what they think an elephant looks like. And the person standing or sitting on its back 
touching its ear will say, well, the elephant, I think well, it's soft and it's floppy and it moves. It produces some wind, some air. So I think an elephant looks like a fan, but the person standing near its tail will say, well, it's actually thin and it feels a little bit rough and there seems to be some hair at the bottom. So I think an elephant looks like a rope. But then the person standing near one of its uh, legs, uh, I don't know if you call it a leg with an elephant, but um, will feel that it's very robust, round and it's solid, but it cannot be moved. So well, I think an elephant looks like a tree. So they're not wrong, they're all right, but they are missing the, the bigger picture. So it's only by combining all of these knowledges, all of these perspectives, that they can see the full picture. And to me, that is what internationalization of the curriculum is about. And we, when we teach, when we teach our curriculum to our students, we are in a way blind because we use a certain curriculum and that is often uh, the, the traditional knowledge systems that we use in academia are often very focused on the Northern Hemisphere, Anglo-Saxon literature. Um, and for me in Europe, it, is, it has a very Eurocentric perspective. That is what we know, that is the reality we live in and there's nothing wrong with it, but it might only be the leg of the elephant or the tail um, or its nose. It might not be the full picture. So by bringing in experiences for students to co-create and to learn together with students with a different perspective, they might get the big picture. And this big picture, of course, is necessary if we want to help them develop the skills necessary to thrive in, in, in 21st century and to work on those very wicked problems or complex problems that the UN has collected in the Sustainable Development Goals. So putting the pieces together to see the big picture is necessary, but how do we teach students the skills necessary to collaborate, so the skills to really collaborate and learn from these different perspectives? Because it's one thing to say it's important, but how do we then do it? Um, we have seen in the video different examples of it, and COIL or virtual exchange is one way, and it's one of the interventions that, um, that can do that. And it has, um, it has taken a large uptake as so many, many more universities have taken on COIL um, to internationalize the curriculum. And I'm very happy and very excited about that. But I do wanna remind people that uh, COIL or virtual exchange has been around much longer, more than a decade uh, before the pandemic. So it's great that there are many more players, but it's not a new phenomenon. And uh, we are seeing also some developments there. Um, one of the questions, of course, that we're asking and one of the things that we're seeing is how can we create equitable, fair collaboration and how can we really bring in these different perspectives that they all feel empowered to share these perspectives and their experiences in a COIL collaboration and how can, how can it help students to learn to co-create knowledge, right? So, these 20 minutes, obviously, I'm not going to provide the answer, maybe more questions, but it's good to have some questions when we ponder, you know, why, why we do, why we make the choice, for example, to do virtual exchange. When we demystify it a little bit, and I think many of you already know what COIL is, so I'm not going to dwell too much on it, but it, the essence for me is that it involves a, a, a collaboration across difference. So that can be an international, but it can also be an interdisciplinary, uh, different languages, different ages, but it is a collaboration across difference, right? So the cross difference collaboration where people with different backgrounds and different knowledges collaborate to create new knowledge or to learn to solve a certain problem. And they do this by using technology. So it is a technology enabled uh, intervention, curriculum intervention. It's not technology driven, but it is technology enabled. That means that we do need to engage students in some sort of online interaction. Um, and we're seeing also now with the blended intensive programs, uh, a mix where we do short-term mobility, in-person encounters combined with uh, the blended part would be that it's combined with virtual exchange. So these are all interesting and, and exciting uh, new ventures and new funding possibilities. But even those always have some sort of online interaction. Now the two critical parts for me, and this is pure, 
curriculum design, it starts with internationalized learning outcomes. So what is it that we want the students to, to learn? And these student outcomes, these internationalized student outcomes are often aimed at developing global perspectives or intercultural competence or um, global citizenship uh, skills. So this is the, the aim of, of the COIL project. And then in order to assess whether students have learned that, often there is a reflective component. And this reflective component touches upon the part of the process of collaboration. So not necessarily the output, the product that this collaboration produces, but the process of getting to that answer. So this is an important aspect that I'll circle back to in a minute. So what does it look like? There's four different phases in a COIL project. Um, it starts with an icebreaker, like many things where people have to feel like they are a team and that they can establish some level of trust to be able to um, learn something together and, and feel comfortable enough despite their differences to collaborate, to, to work together and solve this problem. The second phase is when they organize the project and they have comparative discussions. So they compare their local realities with one another and they look at you know, the, the best practices that they experience or they compare their knowledge system with maybe another knowledge system. But the third part is where in, in, in terms of this conference and, and what we're doing here today, what is interesting, this. This third phase is about the collaborative task and the problem solving. So this is where we ask the students to think beyond the compare and analyze the differences. So once you have analyzed these differences, what new ideas can you come up with? So this we don't always see in COIL projects or virtual exchange projects. It's challenging to develop these. But this is where the potential for co-creation really lies. When we invest in, in this third phase, that is really the, the main driver for why we do COIL with people in location X. And then the final phase is when we reflect and the reflection can be part of the assessment and we evaluate the experience. And to give you an example of a project that we developed just before the pandemic and implemented at the start of the pandemic between South Africa, Durban, health sciences students, and they were also adult learners and uh, students in Amsterdam from a marketing program and their course was on um, international marketing. The health sciences students did a course on nutrition and their task was to create a dietary recommendation for young professionals. So they started by exchanging pictures, a view from my window and sharing some stories during lockdown because this was at the very start of the first lockdown. And, and then the collaboration uh, consisted of two phases. The first phase is where they mind mapped what they ate, what they ate throughout the day, what they considered to be healthy foods and what foods they could find that were both considered nutritious in the global north and in the global south and in these big cities in Amsterdam and in Durban and with their different cultural backgrounds. Um, so they, they mapped this out to see where are their commonalities and what could be considered healthy. So out of this big mind map, where they also tracked what the carbon footprint would be of that consumption. Um, out of that big mind map, they created an advice. And then the advice, of course, because it was for young professionals, the marketing students um, then started to get seriously involved. They brought in their skills, not necessarily about nutrition, but about finding your target group and packaging and message so that people would actually read it. So how to use social media, how to use communication strategically so that people will actually read it. So this is an example of where you can get students that are very different, different ages, different disciplines, different languages, different cultural backgrounds to work together, to become a team because only together they can look at, so what is the, the elephant in the room and how can we address this elephant and how can we make the elephant read what we, you know, what we produced. So how do we get from lots of little building blocks to actually constructing a house, a house that will not fall down. And to me, constructive alignment is, is uh, very important. So we really look very strategically at what are the learning outcomes what are the activities that students are doing and how do we assess whether students have learned? Now, um, we, we saw in some of the presentations also uh, on, on the videos, 
uh, we can speak of the formal curriculum, the informal and the hidden curriculum. When I talk about Goyle virtual exchange, <laughs> Excuse me. We often talk about the formal curriculum. That's why I talk about assessment and learning outcomes in, for the informal curriculum or hidden curriculum. This does not always apply, but there's still, of course, a lot of learning that can occur. But just to contextualize a little bit, I'm talking about this, this uh, formal curriculum. So what are some of the challenges? And for academics and students, there are different challenges. And I'm curious, and maybe later on you can tell me whether this resonates with you or maybe you identify different challenges. But um, academics, I mean, we stand in front of this group and we like to be right right we like to say this is the way uh, this is the knowledge that you need in order to be employable uh, and just follow my lead so now we're inviting them we're asking them to design something where they don't have all the answers and we're asking them to design truly for collaboration that goes beyond compare and contrast and analyze the sometimes obvious differences so how can we get students with very different life experiences and, and different cultural backgrounds to truly collaborate, to learn how to collaborate and how can we assess and value that collaboration and not just the product that comes out of that collaboration. So this is not an easy task and it's definitely sometimes new for, for certain academics and certain universities. And we also want them to imagine interdisciplinary learning. So how can a student become a better professional in your discipline but by working and learning with somebody with a different discipline, this is sometimes difficult to imagine. So this is another thing that we're asking academics to do. And then how they engage with this learning, the, instead of being the sage on the stage, you know, the one that shares their knowledge and exper expertise, um, they actually become the guide on the side, a coach. This is a completely different way of engaging with students and interacting with students that can also be challenging. And then, of course, there is, whether you want it or not, there is an element of intercultural ambiguity and intercultural learning. And how do we facilitate this? And how do we become this guide on the side or this coach for intercultural learning? And how can we become cultural mentors? So one way to tackle these challenges for us in Amsterdam, and we see with many universities, is professional development. And I'm very happy that there's more and more recognized professional development for internationalization of the curriculum and actually Avika and I, uh, we do this um, inter-university collaboration, three different universities of applied sciences in the Netherlands that collaborate to help academics develop the skills necessary to do COIL, but many other things as well. Now for students, there's a different type of challenge. And I don't know if you've ever seen this picture, but I find it fascinating is where part of the sea where two oceans meet and they don't mix. Um, and sometimes for students, it feels the same because they have you know, spent a lot of time and attention to choose a certain discipline and choose a, a certain career. And it's difficult for them to imagine like, why would I mix this up? Um, I wanna stay within my lane. So we are asking them to venture out of their comfort zone of traditional learning and to do something completely different. And how do you know for sure that you will learn, that you will be assessed, that you will get a good grade. And we're asking them also to collaborate across difference. And this is also not always easy to do. It's human nature to try and recognize ourselves in others, so to find and to seek out people who are the same. And um, sometimes within programs, there can be very different people, that, but then what binds them is the fact that they all study the same thing. So now we're asking them to engage with difference and across difference on many different levels. So this is challenging, obviously, and not something that's always jumped, up, jumped into with great enthusiasm. So just like you know, the saying this is, it says it takes a village to raise a child, it takes an entire multi-stakeholder approach to internationalize an institution and to embed internationalization at home in an institution. So internationalization at home often starts with academics. So without curriculum and academics and programs, we can't really do much because we need to be very close to where the learning occurs. But in order to do that, we need many more stakeholders. International relations obviously is a very important partner. They have the knowledge of partnership, of funding, of mobility. 
but then also there's the blended learning specialist, the, the people with the knowledge of uh, educational technology, and especially now, and especially if we consider online uh, collaboration, and these are important stakeholders. There's curriculum developers. It's not always a different role in my university in, or many Dutch universities. There are like I and edu there are people like me uh, that are educational advisors, so they have a background in pedagogy and curriculum development, so they can help with the constructive alignment with collaborative learning. There's of course the world of work, the the the. Um, often the, the people that we educate for, but they can also be part of our programs. And in one of the videos, it also, uh, this was also mentioned. So the world of work can be brought into this um, as a stakeholder, as for example, commissioner for assignments for students, not just for internships. The world of work can also be looked more broader um, uh, the local communities in which we find ourselves with, you know, the cities that our universities are, are geographically placed in. That could be a source of, of one of the stakeholders. How do we engage with the community around our university? And of course, so not, certainly not least, um, the students. So how can we connect with the students? And I was very excited in all of the videos and uh, that there's so many examples of how we engage with students to co-create with them. So why not engage students also in, um, in for example, how we develop a virtual exchange or COIL in our universities. So I'd like to leave you with my very last slide is a, draw, is, um, a quote by Picasso. And there's only one way to see things until somebody shows you how to look at them with different eyes. And to me, co-creation means daring to see things differently and inviting new perspectives with the intention to be challenged and to be changed. So this is my question to you as well. And I thank you so much for your time and I welcome questions. Thank you so much, Eva. We've just put an invitation in the chat. So if you have any questions that you'd like to pose to Eva, please put them in the chat now and we'll field them to, to Eva. We can see lots of love for your slides and th those images, I think, are all context that we recognise. So, But it's great to see them presented in that way. So in terms of the challenge of engagement of this form of curriculum internationalisation with colleagues in, in different contexts, if you had to drill down to a specific piece of advice, particularly in the, in the context of the sciences, which is sometimes the trickier nuts to, to crap, in particular when people start to talk about science being a language in its own right, which transcends the need for curriculum internationalization, which I don't think we, we recognize. What, what strategies would you say you've deployed to help with that? And um, that is still, so within our Amsterdam <laughs> context, still a tough nut to crack, definitely. Um, uh, sometimes the, the way in is through the, the soft skills, um, the, the difference uh, we have, big, the, the advantage of being a University of Applied Sciences there, there's always a need for um, different competences, uh, like collaboration skills, communication skills, and we, we see that as part of the portfolio. Um, so that is sometimes our way in. But I've seen wonderful examples um, in South America. There's a lot of South-South collaboration, and for example, a lot of collaboration. I see Andrea Thomas is here as she collaborated with me as well on um, a project between uh, Venezuela and the US. And um, I see also within South America, a lot of uh, examples where also academics from the, the hard sciences uh, engage uh, in, in COIL, but often it is because they do want their students not necessarily to become uh, better professionals in their field because they think that they already have that covered, but they want them to develop those global skills necessary to be employable and to be prepared for the future. Um, so their driver is not always their own discipline. Their driver is often a, 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 a larger drive i don't know if that um uh, if that answers your question. yeah 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 Ab absolutely uh, for me uh, betty Leesk's insights are really helpful but um one way i find that helpful is the way in which we break down curriculum internationalization into different avenues for it so that whilst we want people to engage in multifaceted ways there are different 
horses for different courses and ways to start incrementally because Rome wasn't built in a day. I know Sylvia's got her hand up. Yes, thanks a lot, Eva. Very interesting presentation. I wanted actually to follow on, uh, you know, your answer to Anthony. Uh, and this is part of my reflection as well. Is like, is the way to embed internationalization in the curriculum through learning outcomes, is it inevitably uh, um, linked to connecting internationalization with employability? Because that could be a contested um, terrain in a way, because on the one hand, of course, we recognize the value of, of having this link. But on the other hand, I think we don't want to promote internationalization only for the sake of employability. No, no, agreed. That this, uh, this, I'm shaking my head. Um, absolutely. It can be one of the drivers. So it depends a little bit. Um, so the Faculty of Business and Economics, that is an important pull. Uh, but also a lot of the virtual exchange coil projects have um, real life um, businesses uh, that commission uh, assignments and, and questions and tasks for the students. Um, but I think global citizenship or just citizenship. So in Europe, in the European context, what it means to be a European citizen um, and how to be how to contribute to to that society, definitely. Um, I know well, Avik is here as well. The Hague, I think, has, but maybe Avik wants to to speak on that. But uh, the Hague is connected with global citizenship, maybe more so than employability. But Avik, would you like to comment on that? I don't want to say it for you. No, that, that's right, although there's sometimes a disconnect between what the institutional vision is and what academics are actually doing. Uh, I, I also agree with what you said, uh, Sylvia, that uh, connecting the internationalization at home practices to uh, learning outcomes has a very different um, rationales depending on the disciplinary context as well. So alongside having institutional missions and whether it's global citizenship, um, sustainability, diversity and inclusion, we see all of that kind of rhetoric at the institutional level, but within inside the academic discipline, there might be very different drivers and very different rationales that uh, resonate more with the academics involved. Um, so employability makes sense for the context that Eva and I work in, which is at universities of applied sciences. And so that is a very compelling rationale to use. Thanks, Eva. Thank you. And we can see a couple of questions, which maybe we've got time for. One of them is related to measuring and monitoring impact and any experience you have there, Eva? Uh, yes, so we do monitor. I try to keep track of who's working with whom, uh, but the, the impact uh, is often measured within the course itself. So the, the learning outcomes and the assessment also often connects with, with um, the course itself. And I don't always, uh, my role ends after developing the COIL project. So after implementation, um, I'm, I don't always have access to the students, to the production of, of the students' uh, outcomes. So um, we try to at least monitor um, how many, so the, the, quant the quantitative um, information, how many projects with whom, how many students have been impacted, you know, how many funding, how much funding we have received, et cetera. Um, but uh, we have not worked yet towards um, um, measuring the uh, monitoring the learning outcomes, the impact in that sense. But there is more and more research being done on this, often, though, monitoring the intercultural learning impact um, and not necessarily the, the learning as, as a whole. It's also difficult because every COIL project is unique. Um, and the learning outcomes are always unique. So it's not always easy to measure um, on a larger scale. Thank you. We've got some more questions, but I think we'll get to those at other stages before the end of the, of the session. And we've also got Evica's session later on to look forward to where we can weave some of those in and we can bring back Ava as well to talk about some of those. So <laughs>